So my job tonight is to help set the stage for a wonderful time of adoration. So I'm going to give you a, a little short reflection, and then we're going to expose the Blessed Sacrament, and then I'm going to lead you in various prayers for healing. Heal the mind, heal the heart, and we're going to take a good crack at the body too while we're at it. Next slide. So my reflection tonight, going to check my time here, my reflection tonight is based on what I really thought was an obscure scripture, Isaiah 43, verse 4. I was praying about something very specific. I was asking the Lord or trying to, <laughs> should I say, surrender to the Lord my calling and my ministry to help activate men in evangelization. And what's been on my heart for a long time is to maybe somehow do that at a global scale. And when I was praying about it, I just really felt, you know, that this, this just felt like vanity. It felt like pride. But on the off chance it was a desire from God, I thought I would put it before him. And Isaiah 43 came to mind. And I'm not really that familiar with Isaiah 43. I mean, I will tell you that it is, it is the section of Deutero-Isaiah written in the Babylonian exile. Thank you, chat GPT. So when I thought of Isaiah 43, I thought like, oh yeah, that's all about, you know, the Israelites in exile. I had no idea. But these words literally jumped off the page and were an answer to my question about whether the Lord was calling me to somehow be involved with the nations and activating men. And these are the words I read, and this is the version of the Bible that I cut open to. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you, I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. And it was as if the Lord was saying, you, because I love you, you want men, you got them. It'll cost you your life. So it's been a real source of encouragement and being sort of um, drawn into Jesus' youth and being part of what you guys are doing really, really started to feel a lot like the, this journey towards activating men for the nations. But as I've prayed on this verse, I've realized that this verse is a roadmap for the Christian life in three ways. It describes where to live your life from, what to live your life for, and how to navigate the in-between. Where do you live your life from? It's really important if you want to finish well, you got to start well. And the best place to start is to know that you are precious and honored and loved. For most of us, it's a destination. We're trying to get there. We spend our lives trying to get to having a sense of feeling special, having a sense of being respected, having a sense of being cared for. That's where we're trying to get to. And the Lord says, no, 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 no. That's, that's actually where you start, son. That's the starting point. And this is modeled 
by Jesus himself. Jesus goes down to the Jordan, gets baptized by John. The skies open and the Father says, this is my beloved Son. And Jesus is modeling our baptism. So at baptism, at the start of your journey, you are called precious, honored, and loved. This is your starting point. This is not the end of your life. This is where you start. So now, where you know you're starting from, from a sense of, and I'll see if we can do a little audience participation here, if you start your life with a sense of being precious, honored, loved, can we do that together? If that is your starting point, you are so well positioned for what you're supposed to live for. Because the next verse describes that. Next slide, please. I want to use a slightly different translation. Uh, good. Once you know what you're living from, which is... Then you're ready to live for something. And what are you ready to live for? The people God gives you in return for your life. What are you living for? The people that God puts in your life. God has people that you are to lay your life down for. And now you can because you know that you are God has people in your life right now that he's asking you to lay your life down for. There are people that you have not yet met, met yet that God wants you to lay your life down for. And the reason why you can, there's only one reason why you can, because you know and you feel and you walk knowing that you are Now this makes a lot of sense. The two are really connected. And I think John Paul II does it best. John Paul II, probably the greatest theologian of our time, took one line, one line out of the Vatican II documents and built out a whole theology. If you read the original writings, it's a book this thick. I studied it in school. He built a whole theology on it. And here's the one sentence that John Paul II built his whole theology of the body. Next slide. Man cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. This is from Gaudium et Spes, one of the foundational documents from Vatican II. What that is saying is that we exist as gift. When you are... You're basically a gift. You're a gift. I was, I was trying to think of this. I know that uh, Jesus' youth is really into skits. I thought I should probably come up with a skit, you know, like maybe I could like, maybe I'll have you use your imagination. Imagine me put in a six-foot gift, gift box. 
with, you know, with a ribbon on top. And here I am, the gift. And how funny it would be if I was just there, like in the box, and never given away or never opened. But you are a gift. And for a gift to realize the fullness of their destiny, you need to give yourself away. I can't help but think of that U2 song. I asked ChatGPT, is it okay, like, is it okay if I share the uh, With or Without You song at a Catholic conference? Can we put a theological spin on it? And Father ChatGPT said, go for it. So I'm no Chris Bray, but I'm going to take a try. So I'll sing it once, and then you can follow me, okay? Just one line from With or Without You. And you give yourself away. And you give yourself away. Well done. That's, that's your destiny, folks. You are a gift. And you give yourself away. So, this is a super romantic vision. A super compelling, sound philosophically, moving spiritually. It's the only vision that Jesus has. These are the only kinds of visions that Jesus has. Is a powerful, human, romantic, supernatural vision. But he gives us everything in between to navigate. So you've got this idea that you are... And you're called to give yourself away. How do you navigate the in-between? So you've given your life to your spouse, to your kids, or to a parish or a diocese. I thought we had a bishop here. Or to a religious community. And now you're trying to live it out. And in the day-to-day, -day, you you're not feeling terribly precious. <laughs> and you're not necessarily feeling super honored. And all that to get together, you're not feeling very loved either. So what do you do? Because on paper, and we've got the baptismal certificate to prove it, you clearly are... but you ain't feeling it. And the Lord wants you not just to know it, He wants you to feel it and to live it out. All of the spiritual writers and the saints will say as you progress through the spiritual life that your maturity in your intimacy with God should grow intellectually, effectively, and how you live out your life. As you go from the purgative through the illuminative to the unitive, this is the progression. To be a daughter means to, means to feel like one. To be a son means to feel like one. How does that happen? Only through a life of prayer. And the content of your prayer needs to be about these things. The content of your prayer needs to be about being. So recently I told the Lord, you know, um, I don't get it. I, I thought I got it. I thought, I, I don't get it. I don't get being precious, honored, and loved. Maybe I'm just having a bad day. I just, I do not get it. Can you please help me? And then I thought of my kids. And I thought, oh yeah. Like when I think of my, my Francis and my Don again. Yeah, they're pretty precious. 
when I think of their capability, when I look at their skills, I'm almost intimidated. There's so many things they can do that I will never be able to do. I definitely honor them. But I love them most of all because they're mine. I love my children the most because they're my kids. That's how it works, Lord. That's why I can live my life. When I think about my kids, that's why I can live my life knowing that I'm I'm still scandalized how basically unstable I am. <laughs> I find I have to pray about this all the time. You'd think the sense of being precious, honored, and loved would kind of stay for a while. Maybe get a few days off. Maybe I don't have to pray about it like every day. I, I, I have to. I do. Because, you know, things, things like happen in your day. Do you have things, maybe it's just me, do you have things where something happens and you're like, I don't feel respected by what that person said. How come I wasn't consulted? I was supposed to be at that meeting, they went ahead and had it without me. Why did, why did they make that decision? That's a dumb decision. All those little things that make you feel badly about yourself, or the long list of things that you do wrong yourself. Every day, something happens. Someone does something, or you do something, and all of a sudden, we're not feeling so precious anymore. We're not feeling honored, and we're not feeling loved. So what do we do? We have to come back to the Lord. And so that's why we spend so much time in adoration. Because we're fragile. That while we are objectively precious, honored, and loved, it seems like it takes a journey to kind of feel it all the time. And we're supposed to feel it. But we won't feel it without an in intense prayer life. Ten years of sharing the peace of Christ. Shalom World, God's own channel.